I am a perpetual traveler through the Bible. Please join me for the next part of my journey through the scriptures. Stay as long as you like and let us together discover a bit more about the Bible. In episode 1 about the letter to the Hebrews, we will be learning a bit of background about the letter, who wrote it, when it was written, who it was written to, and the central message of the letter. This is David Wiles, your fellow traveller in Christ, and this is the Journey Through the Scriptures podcast. In starting this series of podcasts, I must first acknowledge and give credit to all those teachers, pastors, theologians, and men and women of God that have together brought me to this moment in time. As Todd Friel, one of my favorite evangelists, titled one of his videos, On the Shoulders of Giants, I have to acknowledge the fact that most of my material is built on the shoulders of those giants of expository preaching like John MacArthur, Ray C. Steadman, David Paulson, R.C. Sproul, Martin Lloyd-Jones, and Alistair Begg. If you want to learn and grow as I have and continue to do so, spend time with these men's books and commentaries. I'm just the spokesperson. I just want to share with you the wonderful things I have learned in my 40 years of serving the Lord. And of course, none of this material is original, and none of it is my thoughts or ideas. This is entirely the work and guidance of the Holy Spirit. It is He that will guide you and me into all the truth. He will not speak on His own. He will speak only what He hears, and He will tell you and me what is yet to come. He will glorify Jesus, because it is from Jesus that he will receive what he will make known to you and me. One of the biggest mistakes I made as a new Christian when I started the Bible study is that I would jump around from verse to verse in the Bible, trying to gain an understanding of Jesus from a single verse or passage. That is like trying to understand a whole picture of a jigsaw puzzle by studying just one piece of it. A single jigsaw puzzle piece cannot help you understand the entire picture. All the surrounding pieces must give context to the piece in the middle. It was only later that I realized that the only way to really understand the New Testament letters as an example was to read the entire letter from beginning to end. That way I could understand the context of the letter, who it was written to, at what time it was written, and for what purpose. The central message of the book of Hebrews is that Jesus Christ is superior to everything and everybody. The author states that in the first three verses, and that is the introduction to Hebrews. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways, but in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory, and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. That is Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. What a wonderful introduction. It states so clearly the central message of the letter to the Hebrews. Hebrews is a letter that has many, many deep truths and I hope I will be able to take you a few steps down the path to the blessing that God has given us in this letter. It is a difficult book, because on the surface we don't know who wrote the book. Hebrews is the only New Testament book where the author is unknown. Although the authorized or King James Version states at the beginning of the letter, this is the epistle of Paul the Apostle to the Hebrews, this is an addition and it's highly unlikely that Paul wrote this letter, as it is quite different from his style of writing. In fact, Paul wrote very rough and ready Greek, the common Greek called Koine Greek, whereas Hebrews is written in a beautiful classical style by someone who obviously had a very good Greek education. Paul, Barnabas, Silas, Peter, Apollos, and others have been suggested as authors. The early church fathers didn't know who wrote this book, and at the end of the day we don't really know ourselves. But in reality, it does not matter at all, because the Holy Spirit is the ultimate author. 2 Peter 1.21 says, 
For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. We can try to work out when the letter was written, so we can put it in its context historically. It is quite obvious, by the way Hebrews is written, that the temple was still standing in Jerusalem. Let's read Hebrews 10 verses 1 to 3 and 11. For since the law is but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never by the same sacrifices which are continually offered year after year make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered? If the worshippers had once been cleansed, they would no longer have any consciousness of sin. But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sin year after year. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sin. These verses clearly imply that the temple as a building still existed when this letter was written, and we know that the temple was destroyed in AD 70. So the letter to the Hebrews could not have been written later than AD 70. We can set an earlier date because in fact this was sent to second generation Christians after the beginning of the church, who have been Christians many years and by now ought to have grown up and matured, and not be on milk anymore, but on meat. Hebrews 5.12 says, In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Therefore, we can say that the earliest date that this letter could have been written was about 50 AD. Jesus was crucified in 30 AD, and the church had to be started. The apostles had to start with their missionary work and establish churches all through the Roman Empire. So we've narrowed it down to when this letter was written, somewhere between 50 AD and 70 AD. But I think we can narrow it down even further. In Hebrews 10 verses 32 to 34, the author states that the Christians have suffered loss of property, but have not yet been martyred. Remember those earlier days after you had received the light, when you endured in great conflict full of suffering? Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You suffered along with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. And in Hebrews 12 verses 4, In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. The earliest martyrdoms started in the mid-60s when Roman Emperor Nero came to power and when the great fire of Rome of AD 64 was blamed on the Christians. So we have narrowed the period when Hebrews was written down to between 60 and 65 AD. So now comes the question, to whom was the letter written? Hebrews was written by an unknown author to a small group of suffering persecuted Jews somewhere outside of Israel. They might have been in Rome. As this final salutation in Hebrews says, Greet all your leaders and all the saints. Those who come from Italy send you greetings. There are no references to Gentiles in the letter. It focuses entirely on the Jews. This indicates that this little church was strictly Jewish, for there is no mention of any Gentile conflict. Unlike the Jews from Palestine or Jerusalem, these Jews had never met Jesus. Everything they knew about him was second hand. They did not even have the New Testament writings. These hadn't been put together yet. So, whatever they knew, they had been told by the apostles and the New Testament prophets. So, to this church of Jewish believers and unbelievers, the Holy Spirit, working through the author, writes to reveal the merits of Jesus Christ and the New Covenant as opposed to the Old Covenant. Before we start this Bible study on the letter to the Hebrews, we will first make a brief return to the book of the prophet Habakkuk in the Old Testament. My Bible translation of choice is the Amplified Bible. Personally, I like this version because it fleshes out the original scriptures for me by adding all the nuances and additional meanings of the original text. 
It does not read very easily, and I call it the full course meal, because you have to work hard and chew lots to get through the entire menu. I always quote from many versions of the Bible, the Amplified Bible, the King James Version, the Revised Standard Version, the Net Bible. I feel that the more translations you have, the clearer picture you will get of the Scriptures. And if you allow the Holy Spirit to open up the Scriptures to you, you will be blessed accordingly. So let us start by opening up the Bible and going to the Old Testament and look for the book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk was one of the twelve minor prophets of the Old Testament. These prophets were called minor prophets not because they were less important than other prophets. They were called minor prophets because their books are shorter than those of the major prophets, like Isaiah and Jeremiah. The book of Habakkuk is quite unique in that it contains no prophecy addressed to Israel. It contains rather a dialogue between the prophet himself and God. In the first two chapters, Habakkuk debates with God over his ways that don't make sense or seem fair to the prophet. In Habakkuk chapter 2 verses 1 to 4, the Lord God's answer to the prophet is recorded. I will take my stand to watch, and station myself on the tower, and look forth to see what he will say to me, and what I will answer according to my complaint. And the Lord answered me, Write the vision, make it plain upon tablets, so that he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its time, it hastens to the end, it will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it, it will surely come. Behold, he whose soul is not upright in him shall fail, but the righteous shall live by faith. What a wonderful encouraging passage. God answers Habakkuk's question of how he could use the mighty armies of the Chaldeans to send judgment over the faithless Israelites. The Chaldeans were proud and dependent on their own strength, which was no match for God's sovereign strength. The same is true of salvation. We cannot rely on our own strength for salvation. We must rely on God's strength through faith. The only way to make our souls right is to live by faith in Jesus Christ. This is the very verse that spoke to the heart of Martin Luther in Germany in 1515. Luther felt the heavy weight of his own sin and the overwhelming responsibility to be good enough for God to grant him righteousness. And as he delved into scripture in his quest for answers, he read Romans 1 verse 17 which says, for in the gospel the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. When Martin Luther looked at the Greek word for righteousness, he saw that the righteousness referred to here is God's righteousness given to believers freely as a gift. He began to understand that righteousness didn't come from him and anything that he could do. Martin Luther recalled that at that moment he became born again. With this new understanding of salvation, Martin Luther, along with a myriad of other reformers, began what is now known as the Protestant Reformation. So, if you attend the Protestant Church, your life has been affected by Martin Luther's salvation that was brought on by Romans 1 verses 17, which includes the quote we have just read from Habakkuk 2 verses 4. Romans 1.17 is not the only place where the Apostle Paul quoted Habakkuk 2 verse 4. He quoted this Old Testament prophet again in the letter to the Galatians. In this letter, Paul was writing to remind the people that following the law does not give salvation. Salvation comes only by faith in Jesus Christ, and again Paul uses Habakkuk 2 verses 4 to prove this point. In Galatians 3.11 he says, Clearly, no one who relies on the law is justified before God because the righteous shall live by faith. The third place where this verse from Habakkuk appears is right here in the letter of Hebrews, chapter 10, verses 38 and 39. But my righteous one shall live by faith, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. So this Old Testament verse has been expanded and amplified in the letter to the Romans, the Galatians, and Hebrews. 
each of these three letters emphasize one aspect of one statement in Habakkuk. I will break that verse into three parts. The righteous shall live by faith. Okay, this is where it gets interesting. The book of Romans focuses on righteousness or the righteous. Those who have been accepted as righteous in Jesus Christ. Romans says the righteous shall live by faith. The book of Galatians emphasizes the word shall live, and it tells us about the life as a justified or righteous person, the walk in the Spirit, the life in Jesus, the life of Christ in us. So in Galatians, the righteous shall live by faith. And finally, the book of Hebrews centers on the last two words, by faith, and it shows us how to lay hold of the life through which we are justified and made righteous. But I hope by now you can comprehend that faith is determined not from anything in itself, but from its object. I'm sure that many Christians are confused by this. I know I was confused in the early part of my Christian walk. Many believers have been told that they must have enough faith to have their prayers answered, as if faith was some sort of commodity that can be weighed and valued. It is almost as if all we have to do is to buy another kilogram of faith and add it to what we already have and then we could do great things for God. The quantity of faith is of very little significance. Read what Jesus himself said in Matthew 12 verses 20. I tell you the truth, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. It is not quantity that is important in faith, it is quality. It is what your faith is fixed to. So, what is the object of your faith? The strength of your faith is directly related to the strength of what you believe in. If you are sitting in a chair listening to this podcast, then you are definitely placing your faith in the chair, that it will hold you up and not collapse. If you are driving in a car while listening to this Bible study, then you are placing a certain amount of faith in the ability of the car to remain on the road. I hope you see my point. By our very nature, the entire human race are beings of faith. We place our faith in various things. We have been designed and created to do that. It is very easy and natural for every one of us. So now, we have come to the point where we have to answer these three questions. What are we believing in? Who are we believing in? What kind of person is he? And this is what the letter to the Hebrews is all about. That is why the title of this Bible study is The Object of Faith. Hebrews talks about faith, and therefore it will help us to see the object of faith. Our faith will be strong if we believe and understand that the object of our faith is strong. Let me repeat that, and let it sink in for a while. Our faith will be strong if we believe and understand that the object of our faith is strong. That is why, in my opinion, Hebrews is the most Christ-centered book of the whole New Testament because it focuses solely on Jesus Christ. It is the best letter to read when we are discouraged, defeated or depressed because it emphasizes the character and quality of Jesus Christ. If we see Jesus Christ as he is, we cannot help but be strong in faith. In Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, he declares, Thanks be to God, he who gives us the victory, making us conquerors through our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is how Hebrews helps us. It helps us to focus on the one who is already in the place of victory, and that one is Jesus Christ. Actually, we are fighting a battle that has already been won, and that is what should encourage us. When we walk in the flesh, we are fighting a battle that has already been lost. There is no chance, no hope of victory when we try to win a victory through our own strength, abilities and efforts. However, when we walk in the Spirit, the battle is already won. This is David Wiles, your fellow traveller in Christ, 
And this has been the Journey Through the Scriptures podcast, episode one.